I'm just realizing that one thing that I haven't seen as clearly as I'm seeing in this conversation is um, the level of strength that there is in optimism. You know, I hadn't, again, I hadn't seen what a, what a powerful level of um, courage and strength there is in optimism, really. Um, but I think it's always there uh, that optimism allows for, gives space to all of the different things that we're talking about. Good morning, it's Victor Purton here at the Centre for Optimism and every Sunday it is my enormous pleasure to introduce the optimist heart. Caroline always says she turns up. I sort of get up at five in the morning already thinking, you know, what am I going to get dressed in? The orange jacket, the orange spectacles. So for me, it's this enormous pleasure. Caroline, you have created something so wonderful that people just love it every Sunday and people watch it in between. Caroline from the highlands of rural New South Wales. Welcome this morning. Thank you very much, Victor. And it's always lovely to show up. It was interesting to show up this morning and you weren't there. It was just your suited form with uh, the orange tie, but all of the other regalia was missing. And oh my gosh, you've got an orange cup too. I was getting my coffee. And uh, Deepa, Deepa has joined us from London. It is such a pleasure, Deepa. I've been reading your life story, but also just the myriad of activities you're in. And so I found it very hard to summarize deeper. And in the end, I said, <laughs> come and meet the woman who slowed down London. <laughs> Deepa Patel, welcome. Thank you very much, Victor. And thank you, Caroline. Deepa, the first, the first question we always ask in the Center for Optimism is, what makes you optimistic? And I know you've been thinking about this deeper. What makes yep. you optimistic? Well, I was optimistic as a child. And I realized as I was growing up and I was looking at this quote from a Sufi teacher called Hazrat Anayat Khan, who says, Optim optimism represents the spontaneous flow of love. And I think that that's what makes me optimistic. What, there's this kind of sense wherever there's optimism, it feels like there is a spontaneous flow of love, that something else is possible, um, that somehow just being present to it is going to bring that kind of surprise and curiosity that I had as a child. That has kind of carried on living in me in some ways. And um, yeah, it's... It, carries on proving to be the case. So that's what makes me optimistic, Victor. That is, is so stunning. You know, I just, um, that entire philosophical viewpoint um, that brings such joy to us. Now, Caroline, yeah. you have answered the, the question many times and you are becoming a great expert on optimism and how optimism feels in your heart. And by the way, I received um, an optimist heart painting from our friend George this week. Wow. It arrived on my birthday. Oh, wonderful. I had bought it for myself, but it arrived on my birthday. <laughs> so Caroline, what makes you optimistic? Okay, so I thought I was off the hook this week because you didn't ask me last week. So all right, what makes me optimistic is that I know that there are subtle laws of the universe that when we align with them, everything works out in our favor every time that's it wonderful well caroline as is our tradition may i hand over the optimist heart to your keeping Marty, thank you thank you victor so hi everyone welcome this morning um i am so delighted i usually am delighted but this morning my heart is it's especially especially um, happy because I get to bring into our conversation into our um, room our community someone who for me I met this year during lockdown on the other side of the world and has just 
been someone I can say is one of the most rich and diamond-like human beings that I've encountered in a long time. And so when I ask, I'm, in fact, I was waiting for the time zones to change a little because she's in London, as Vic said, and normally, uh, you know, it would be two o'clock in the morning, but as we shifted time zones, it's now 10.30 at night. So I said, do you ever stay up, you know, quite, you know, past the 10 o'clock? And she said, I'm happy to come. So Deepa, I am so, so happy to have you here with us um, this morning. And thank you for agreeing to, to be with us. I'm very happy to be in a conversation with you, Caroline. They're always so enriching and I go away feeling different to when I started. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that here. Thank you. So in fact, um, Deepa and I met because someone else and I were having a conversation and I said, and this is someone who moves and shakes worlds if she can. And I said, she said, we have to do something. This is back in March or April. She said, we have to do something. You know, there's so much need. I said, yeah, I know, but I, I really, truly cannot do anything at the moment unless it comes from inspiration. I can't force or plan or drive anything over the top of what's going down. I can only... If I catch something or feel something or someone says something and I go, oh, that's it. Then I can put my everything behind it. But otherwise I can't. I said, I think it's time for deeply enriching conversations where we meander and allow inspiration to emerge. So we began a group and she invited five other women. Two, two sessions later, um, she cancelled it all and said, ah, oh, no, I'm too busy and it's clearly not working. I went, well, it's not working. And I could see the kind of little bit like horumph on the face of a couple of people. So I said, you know, I might just follow this up. Is that okay? And the others wanted to stay connected. And then someone brought deeper in. And it was, it's just been this, every two weeks we get together. We don't have an agenda. We don't even have like formal structure. And it, it just emerges into something exquisite. Um, so when I had to write about Deepa and introduce her, I had no idea really what she does. It, we'd been meeting for six months, every two weeks. We don't really know what each other do, we do in the world. But I knew it would be special and I started to research and I saw all these, as Vic said, very eclectic, like, um, you know, working as the executive director of a theatre company for people of colour and then working with the London School of uh, Fashion and the University of Sheffield together with the UN um, High Commission for Refugees in a camp in Jordan about the power of imagination and then working with camp uh, activists on how to better, you know, improve their campaigning and uh, and all sorts of change management stuff, as well as running retreats. And, and I said, yeah, this is someone I get. Because it's not about what you do. You can do anything from who you are. And this is what I'm really happy to be with you today, being with who you are. And the many, many accomplishments and the many gifts that you bring to the world, and I'm sure receive in the giving as well. So, Deepa, I have a question for you because I know a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little about your, your journey of this 2020? Because it's, it's combined with the whole corona, but it's not only that. You've been on a transitional journey and this yeah. week I've been writing quite a bit about transition. So I'd love for you to kind of sure. take a bit of a meandering journey about that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, I started 2020 um, in a place where I was dealing with chronic pain. And I've, that had never happened. It started uh, in the summer before that, 
but by January this year, it was getting really bad. And it was, it was at a point where I really couldn't do anything else but just be in pain. And so when, when we started to go into lockdown, it was like I was already in lockdown in my body and really um, was, was struggling with how to find my way out. And I know for many of us who have been on, um, you know, journeys of self-discovery for a long time, there's a point that we get to and it's like, I've done all this work and I'm still here. Why? What am I going to do? I mean, I've done the therapy and I've done this and I've done that. And you go through the list of the myriads of things that you've done and then you're back in this place again. And it feels like there's nothing that can shift that place. And so I found myself very much there. I think even probably just before we had started our conversations and there's a kind of um, pessimism. So let's, let's look at, uh, if, if we're gonna think of uh, optimism, the pessimism of like, I'm never gonna get out of this place. This is like, this is, you know, just the most horrible place to be. And, I fought with myself, as we do in that place, very strongly. Um, and I think there was a point that I kind of connected back to a story of my life, which has been around my relationship with death and dying in different ways. And in fact, it's also connected in some ways to the spiritual path that I've done. I think um, dying, has been one of my greatest teachers really. Uh, so partly out of depression and of, of, uh, in my early 20s and of kind of dealing with, with sort of feeling like all I wanted was to end life, um, partly because I've also um, suffered from asthma and at one point was in hospital with that. So, so death has always been this, this very important teacher in my life and there was a point um, in about March where after doing all of the fighting and of everything else there was a part of me that went there's actually something here that's trying to die mm -hmm. and I think that that was a really important moment for me um, to sort of stop to stop trying to fix things to stop trying to do anything else and to go all right what if I accepted that there is something here that's that's trying to die um, what do I do then? And I remember this, this moment where I was looking out of the window. I think one of the reasons I appreciate the, the lesson of death is because it always brings me into the present moment. There's, there's a point at which it's like, this could be my last moment. Mm. Now what? What do I want to do with that moment? And I was looking out of the window at the beautiful trees that are in the garden and I had this very strong sense that I had never really allowed myself just to be here. That that throughout life it had always been like, you know, and I, and I think that that's also part of being in the world at the moment. It's like, how can I serve the world? What's it, what is it that I can give to the world? Um, or it's, the, you know, there was a seesaw between the fixing and the serving, as it were. And that moment of looking out at these trees, there was this sudden realization of like, what if I was just allowed to be here? That I didn't have to do anything here, that there, there wasn't gonna, there's, there's, there was no point to anything. I could just be here like this tree that was in front of me. And so these were like, very, these have been two really important moments actually of the year. For me, it was, this was very much this thing of like, something in me needs to die and I'm actually allowed to be here just for the sake of it. There's no, no other reason. And um, that was like the moment of starting to really shed some things that if you'd asked me, I'd have said, oh yeah, I think I've, I've got this one. But I don't think I'd ever really allowed myself to just be on this planet, mm -hmm. to not have to um, prove myself for any reason. So I think, I think when I met you, those were the two things that were really kind of ruling my life. And I had um, probably about 
six or seven years ago, I used to volunteer in a children's hospice. And that was a very, very special time. Most people, when I say, oh, I volunteered in a children's hospice, in a children's hospice always sort of say, God, that must be so painful. But I have to tell you, it was probably some of the most joyous times I've ever spent because there's something very authentic about being in spaces like that. There's nothing that's left out. In fact, there's a, there is, I would say, in terms of this conversation, an optimism of a different kind, which is grounded in a reality that at some point we are going to, our lives are going to end. Um, and so we have to be fully present and fully here. And I and I always remember I'd, on a Friday, I'd be the person that was on, on duty at the reception as people came in. It was a place where children came to die, but it was also a place where children came to and their families came to actually get some respite for a weekend. And if there was even a hint of pity or a kind of like, oh, this is just so sad, um, the children, and, and a lot of them had, you know, real kind of... Um, severe disabilities in different ways they would just turn away they wouldn't even kind of engage so that was a real true learning experience for me of, of like what it means to be authentic in 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 the greeting of whatever was coming up and i think that those were all of the things that sort of started to come alive in a different way in this period of lockdown I could carry on talking forever, Caroline. So you, you should stop me if you if you have any desire to ask me questions as I'm kind of uh, bubbling away on these things. Yep. So I felt like each day in in the beginning of that lockdown, after I was in this period, it would be like getting up and saying, "Well, today I'm not going to have this day again. How do I want to be today?" And I also started to kind of say, who do I want to be having conversations with here? If I was really in a hospice and I was treating my life as though I really was in a hospice at that point, who do I want to be talking to? And I had some really um, stunning conversations. As you said, that was an important part of it. I, and alongside stunning conversations, also just stunning discoveries um, of new ways of being in the world that hadn't really been there before because I think the lens had always been how can I use this to help or how what do I need to change and to suddenly just have the lens of I'm here I'm allowed to be here there's no other reasons was just yeah a very it's been a very life-changing transformative um, process. I, I wonder Deepa how many others may have parallel kind of years because as you're speaking i go absolutely i didn't set my space up as a hospice so i think in some ways i have the feeling it was like um like a maternity hospital like i was being born again which sounds you know i don't mean in that christian sense but i guess in a spiritual sense for sure and there were you know that to live with whatever emotions were there and I went into lockdown sort of six weeks before lockdown before the coronavirus mm -hmm. even hit so similar um I just knew that my life was changing and and I didn't I couldn't continue doing the things that I had been doing or act the way I had been acting um that something fundamental was on the move and so I just said okay I have to go underground I have to go underground and and let it emerge. Um, I thought it would be quicker than it has been, but it's been extraordinary because it, in that space, it's like, it's hard to hide from emotions, from thoughts, you know, those, the, and there was some, there was one moment, which for me was kind of a little bit like you say about allowing yourself to be, because I kind of got to, got to this point this year, Oh, if I'm not doing something for others, what value am I? You know, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I got past it and I thought, if I'm happy, if I can keep myself happy, that's a good vibe in the world. If anyone I interact with goes away feeling like, oh, like at an energy level, whether they acknowledge it or not, they go away feeling good or I can just spread the vibes where I am. That's not a bad thing. 
And if I can be happy, that's a good thing because it's my life. So I kind of got to that. But one day after I'd been kind of trying and I'd been just, I decided to rejig what I was doing and do stuff online before the whole online thing became a boom. Um, but I was just going down a rabbit hole with all the technology. And I just, at one point I just said, no, nah, forget it. I can't. <laughs> um, I'm taking a step back. And then I moved and I went, oh, okay, I'm, I'm all good. I'm all good. And then one day I caught the same kind of thought. I thought, oh my God, I still have this thing that unless I'm delivering something, unless mm -hmm. I'm able to kind of deliver an outcome, what's my worth? Uh, after 30 years of doing this stuff day in, day out, that's still there. I uh, thought, wow, you know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't ever end. You know, you still catch these things or let me ask you, how's your, how's your body now? How's the pain? How's what's happened there? Well, um, it's, it's pretty much gone. <laughs> so I think that was a very good lesson for me in terms of, uh, I mean, I'd been through all of the, um, situations of you know all of the tests and everything else and finally had seen a neurologist who said um this is in your head so i needed to do the work with my head in terms of its relationship to pain and a number of other things so it's pretty much gone it's you know it was at an eight out of ten at the beginning and now it's a one uh, out of ten and uh yeah, I think it was it was a it, it's been a pretty miraculous journey in the sense of what did happen as I allowed myself to be. I can see that actually my whole nervous system started to calm down. That that it didn't need to have any, you know, it wasn't working at at, at this ridiculous rate in terms of alertness or anxiety. It sort of changed pretty dramatically. And don't. Don't you feel, or I'm, this is like a total leading question, <laughs> or how do you feel? Now, this thing of, you know, how long have you been on your path of discovery, your spiritual journey? I think since my teens. Yeah. Really? So I don't know how old you are, but, you know, a significant chunk yeah. of time. Yeah, pretty much most of my life. Yeah. At so, this point. Significant chunk of time. And... And still this level of, you know, kind of hyped up, ramped up nervous system that goes between and, you know, can dance across from, you know, um, de more depressive energies right through to mm -hmm. hyper anxiety. And I think I can say that I've journeyed and still do at times much less through those yeah. two. But I think that people who really are in the grip of you know a world that's in turmoil and have these layers anyway of these energies in flux um without a kind of holding or a container for making sense of things mm -hmm. don't know how i truly don't know how people get through the day yeah i i think that's really true I think that's really true. Mm. I know that um, my getting through the day now, in terms of what's happened since, a large part of it um, actually does involve the stopping and saying, I'm, I'm allowed to just be here. You know, particularly because in a way things have gone back to in terms of work and all of those things, you know, I'm back to that level of delivery and all of those things. So it's very easy to shift back into the doing mode. Um, so that balance of, oh, I'm just, I'm just allowed to be here has, is a very important part of, um, of doing that. And, and I don't take any of this I work, um, as you mentioned earlier, I work in a refugee camp in Jordan. And um, 
sometimes I, it can feel very easy that this is a nice little bubble. You know, I can say all of these things because of the world in which I live and in all of the privilege that I have. One of the things, again, one of the reasons that it's felt so important to be doing that work and being in the refugee camp and people go, oh, it must be very hard to constantly be going back into those spaces. But again, there's a level of authenticity mm. that seems to arise from people who have had to ha have taken courageous steps in their lives where love, you know, I, I said that optimism for, for me as Hazrat Naik Khan said is the spontaneous flow of love. Well, there's a level, the flow of love in in the camp is just unbelievable it's so there mm -hmm. and it it's it the flow of love and that sense that um pain is also allowed to be present because again i think that sometimes it's it's like we get into this oh yeah flow of love sorry to put on that voice but do you know what i mean and then and then what happens to to all of that pain and that suffering but when when both of those are allowed to be in the space together so this 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 word allowance keeps coming up then i think that there's there's a sort of freedom that seems to come from it of course there isn't freedom in the real sense but uh, when you're in a refugee camp but there's there's something about a, that flow being there that that brings a sort of ease in a place which is very difficult Mm. So um, I can really see how this thing about the spontaneity and flow of love are kind of critical to so many aspects of um, what I do in the world and um, how to be in the world. And I, that's what I think Zoom has also allowed for, is learning how to be in the world um, rather than a constant sense of doing. So. Yeah, it's interesting what, when you said many things you say. I mean, you know, we could just stop and meander down many different tributaries, starting with different words that you've nominated. And I think one thing that I, when you said it's not the real kind of freedom, but maybe it is the real kind of freedom. You know, they that I think that often I, you know, I look here in Australia and. And we're in a pretty good shape now. I know that in London things have gone, you know, going into the yeah. second wave. And so, but in Australia we're in pretty good shape. And there is, I, I mean, there is a sense of freedom that I experience in terms of being able to do that, to go out. And um, I just bought a car yesterday, which, you know, wow. got on the heels of our session last week with the UN high level champion of climate action. I, I shouldn't declare that I just bought a car <laughs> and uh, it's the first time in my life I haven't had a car um, and but I think there's something really exquisite that I don't know if you ever saw there was a um, documentary Alain de Botton the the philosopher yeah and he went into the slums in Calcutta and he was he was researching I forget what he was researching but basically I think it was communities and societies and he went into these slums and he got all the way in there and he said in the end these were the the places of most happiness and love and in a sense freedom I think is that you could ever find because everyone belonged they were clean apart from the there wasn't you know basic hygiene but within that over that it was it was impeccable and the elderly had roles the children had roles the youth the parents everyone uh -huh, had uh -huh. purpose and a meaning but not more than just being you know they had their roles within the being of community so when you talk about the, what goes on in the camp and and I think when you pair away, like Eckhart Tolle says, you know, you never find yourself more by adding more things. It's only when you strip away that you get to who you are. So when there's simplicity yeah. and not the pretense of sophistication, nor all the trappings, there's something raw 
And, and I, I think we can say, you know, we can say that about a camp, but it can be the same about ourselves as, as you talked about with your hospice or, you know, my year has oh. been similar. Like stripping away is something raw and painful and yet revealing of the most beautiful aspects of who we are too. Yeah, as I'm, as I'm listening to you um, speak, one of the things that's coming up for me is what it means to, this year it's been about really letting go of my identities, the many identities that I um, realize that, uh, you know, that they're, they're like security blankets. So they don't allow for that rawness. They don't allow for this, like, I'm right here in a conversation with you and I've just met Victor. Like, it, even just taking this moment to realize what that means. When I'm in my identities, I, I don't do that. And, and, you know, I can feel it just right now. I'm like, oh, this is, this is such a, there's something really lovely about it to, to sort of realize there's this man who's doing all this wonderful stuff on optimism and there's all of the things that I feel about you. But that doesn't happen when I'm clinging to anything. It, it happens when I, when I'm here, right here in the rawness, when it is a sort of like, well, I don't know what's possible. You know, and I go again to say, well, that's optimism for me. Optimism exists in this moment. Of, of, and just, you know, even looking now at the little chats, there's all of these people that I don't know, but they're right here with us. And that's just extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No identity. So I'd say that was a big part of this year. I don't know what that was like for you, Caroline, but... I certainly feel like this year has been a real stripping away from all of these identities that I've, I'm glad for them, that they, they were important to have. And I'm also glad to be saying um, goodbye to them that's, in a way. That's, that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that line in the chat. Yeah, I can, I can see that my life is never going to be the same again after meeting Victor. <laughs> it's, we're a very joyful community, Deeper, and your <laughs> quote will be um, on Twitter and LinkedIn for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. I, look, I think this is such a a fundamental kind of tightrope dance, if you like, I think, because I, I, I think in these times, spirituality is calling us to be, be that in the world, not in monasteries, and not in convents, and not on mountaintops. It's calling us to understand deeply, to to know you have to play roles in the world, you have to go out there and do stuff and sometimes you even have to put on something that looks remotely like a work cloth, um, you know, um, but, but that they're really just roles, they're extensions of core essence, even before personality, you know, this kind of spark and it and it it is uh someone said yesterday in a, a i meet with a gorgeous group of friends on saturday morning and and we you know read some text spiritual text and and tear it apart i mean we don't tear it but we stretch it <laughs> to understand and um someone said you know it's so challenging because the world is full of the lure of you know, for each identity, come here, we'll make you this or mm -hmm. interesting for you. And, you know, even things like technology and uh, social media. And, and of course, it's true. And this is the, you know, if you go the Martin, not Martin Campbell, Joseph Campbell, I know Martin Campbell, mm -hmm. Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey. It's, it's really that, in a sense, to go out, be out in the world and have the courage to show up without masks and and overcome the lure of the, the the dragons and the monsters and their their kind of seduction of your 
identities that want to get puffed up. So it's, it is raw, but it's very glorious when you meet someone who's stripped down and present. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what's been the difference for you then with this year of this buffer zone, if you like, of the death, the, which, you know, in the spiritual terms, they talk about dying alive, right? You die to mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And So this, this year and it's, it's I, said, I feel terrible, I'm going, this year and that death, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this year and the death. No, but that sort of, the death of, of something that wasn't like really deeply true. How are you finding emerging from that? And, and going back out and doing the things that you were doing before and how is it impacting? How is it different? There's a part of me um, that still... Well, I want, uh, the word that came was struggling. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the right one and... and maybe this you'll understand it more i think that the level of anxiety that we're living with in terms of climate change and what we're going to do about it is is there as a sort of um low hum and i think what i'm grateful for this year is in terms of having this thing around allowing myself just to be here is that I can actually now turn to that in a new way um which I which I really felt like I needed because I don't know about you but I I I am really um how we deal with 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 this this level of crisis is is a is you know, something that occupies my mind and my heart and my body um, on a continual basis. And I can, uh, there's a part of me that's like, I cannot be in conversations about how we're going to stop using plastic straws, which Mm -hmm. is just such a tiny little thing. And we all think like we're doing something really good because I'm not using a plastic straw do you know what I mean to actually the level of change that's that's needed in this world so uh, part of this year is for me or or even being in the refugee camp I mean it's it is completely outrageous that we as human beings are doing what we're doing to each other so that has a presence um, for me in different ways and and I think the letting go of identities, part of that is about um, actually what I'm hoping for is that I become more courageous in what's my part to do. So it's interesting to come back to that yeah. after living in the sense of I'm allowed to just be here. Um, to, to have that be the kind of constant alongside this hum of we're in a crisis, what the hell are we going to do about it? So I think paradox is part of what it means to live in the world nowadays and our willingness to be present to the opposites. Um, to, to truly, in an, I, I'd again use the word optimistic because I think that that's needed in terms of holding opposites. Um, it, it, leads to less polarization but that's where I am right now it's 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 sort of like coming turning my attention back to these things and really sort of um seeing them with new eyes you Mm -hmm. know um we have that a lot in in on spiritual paths how do we come back with beginner's minds how do we see things with new eyes I was um just before I came onto the call, I was looking at this quote from um, Rilke, where he says, uh, um, "Eyes of the work, uh, the, the work, the, uh, the work of the eyes is done. Now it's time to go to the heart 
and allow all that's imprisoned there to be set free. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think that, that um, it is going to be the heart that leads us out of this place that we're in. Yes, we have all of the technological solutions we need. Yes, there's that political, but ultimately I have this sense that it's going to be the heart that really, um, really gives us the answers to, to what we need. Yeah. Which, which means feeling. Yeah. And, and like you said, being able to sit with the polar opposite sometimes in those, the, the energies of old feelings that we've maybe not allowed to emerge. And, you know, people are medicating beyond belief, the feelings of life. And so I think that's a really significant challenge is, you yeah. know, how to, uh, one of, in my spiritual explorations and path that we talk about the power to tolerate, but I think it, I, I always felt there's something, you know, not quite mm -hmm. right with the idea of tolerating others or, and I think it's being able to tolerate the energies which are the kind of consequences of feelings or uncomfortable emotions yep. as consequences of past actions or past thoughts or past ways of, of being or, or way I'm tuning into or perceiving creates the dis, these energies of like, whether it's guilt or shame or fear or doubt or, you know, all of those kind of lower frequencies. So, I have to tolerate it, you know, yeah. and, and what I've discovered when I, when I don't do action or eat or do something that avoids it is that it goes. Mm -hmm. If I allow it to be allow, mm -hmm. I mean, I think allowing to be is pretty fundamental in this conversation, <laughs> but if I allow those is to be knowing that they're coming on their way to go, they're passing. Mm -hmm. If I struggle with them, if I try to suppress them or avoid them, they persist. But if I bless them on their way, and they sometimes take a little longer than others, but but they go. And I and I think if we're talking about the way forward is the heart, we need to learn these kinds of things because the heart can't be big and open and connecting and as beautiful and optimistic as, as is its nature, when there are all these barriers to the kind of ca channel of feeling, because we don't want to feel the bad things. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I've noticed, Caroline, for myself, and maybe, again, it's like, how do we how do we let go of the idea at some point there aren't going to be these barriers? Because to me, they're always going to be, they're part of the work of the heart, really. And, and why I say that is because I'm, I'm aware that, that in more than one meeting in the last 10 days, I've ended up in tears. And, um, you know, what's interesting is people's reactions to those tears and my own reaction to those tears it, it's it's sort of like um i'd be fine if i was laughing in all of those meetings but i'm i'm not okay about crying in those meetings and and what why the, my tears are as uh, and also what my heart is saying so i think that's one of the things also for me that that's that's really interesting and and i know that the moment i've cried then I'm kind of done and I can go to the work that we're actually doing in the meeting. Whereas if I don't cry those tears right there and then when they're, when they're welling up, you know, cause what we do in meetings is like, well, we're not allowed to cry. So we'll sort of swallow it all. Then the, then the work just ends up being shit really. I, I, I mean, I can see that for myself Whereas when I cry, then I'm done and then we get on with it. You, you know, and I yeah. feel the same for anyone else that I'm in a meeting with. Once they've done that, 
actually it opens up something that's refreshing yeah. it's like suddenly we're all you know we're back to that rawness that we were just talking about we're present to each other we're aware we're, we're aware of each other's vulnerabilities we're aware of all of that and now we return to the work in this in this much more kind of deeper more profound sense so i have i i can completely see this there was this part of me that's like at some point it's going to be like a completely clear and pure thing and i'd I don't know if it's ever going to be there because I think the heart is able to hold all of these complexities. It is able to hold um, our shame and this and that. It's, it's, it's all possible there. Um, it's just how we're allowed to kind of bring it in. Does, does that make Yeah, yeah. I guess what I was saying is if we don't allow. Yeah, totally. Suppressing and we don't yeah. allow uncomfortable feelings to yeah. to, to exist, exist. We yeah. other feelings as well we block the whole channel yeah yeah totally yeah so yeah i mean that's huge courage right and i mean maybe you know a lot of people in these meetings and you just cry no 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 <laughs> not always with me so um <laughs> but, but it's a big courage to be authentic to be real in in that moment isn't it but what it does do is exactly what you said it changes the vibration in the room and people can feel a little uncomfortable but if you're comfortable in your uncomfortability too if you're just current yeah. current, people get real and start to tune in like to a single resonance right yeah where, mm -hmm. when now when we're working the work is being done from that vibration not from our heads not yep. from ideas the ideas help and the head helps but it's channeled through a resonance that's a sort of purity of the moment yeah yeah and I, i'm just realizing that one thing that i haven't seen as clearly as i'm seeing in this conversation is um the level of strength that there is in optimism you know, I hadn't, again, I hadn't seen what a, what a powerful level of um, courage and strength there is in optimism, really. Um, but I think it's always there uh, that optimism allows for, gives space to all of the different things that we're talking about. I have a question. I don't know about the, in the Sufi path. And maybe we do a little meditation in a minute before we do our... Mm -hmm our final close, but I want to ask you a question about the idea. Do you have and walk with the idea of being an instrument, uh, you know, where, which is a great, um, for me, it's a great kind of uh, substitute identity. So rather than, excuse me a sec, something, something has just happened here. My, oh the computer went off on a tangent um so on its own um yeah we're we're rather than having layered on identities you can just sort of say well i'm here and i'm an instrument for something to happen however big small in between doesn't matter i'm i'm available and that gives a sort of distance to the ownership of a thing, of an outcome, but does that does that play a part in your way? Oh, of it, like to, it's totally central to it, and I I think that if anyone knows um, the poet Rumi, who's who's often the poet that we turn to in Sufism, then one of his kind of main um, themes has been about being the reed, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that what you are is this 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 empty there's just holes and that the music comes because there is this complete emptiness in in the reed so being an instrument i think has that same connotation for me of, of being uh yeah ready to to serve this moment really is, is the way that i put it yeah. um and then i think we have the the, the work always carries on because the moment we 
identify ourselves as that, as that instrument, we know we're not an instrument anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so it, it, it's sort of this interesting thing because I, I can see the times where I've even taken that as my identity and, and kind of gone, yes, I'm an instrument. Uh, not quite in that way, but, it, but it's sort of there. So, so that's what I think is just um, part of this nature of, of evolution, of, of constantly evolving, becoming finer, you know, and more refined in that sense of being, uh, being the instrument so that the notes get sweeter and sweeter because you've forgotten yeah. that, uh, your own identity and have just become the instrument and you're no longer um, concerned about that really yeah and, that, and that, whether you're an instrument or you're not an instrument so. exactly I mean <laughs> there is a sense though I and it's a slippery one right because there's a, sometimes a sense of such a privilege of yeah. being able to be present when something happens you know around you through you with you and yeah. you get to be there and observe it and experience it and be part of something you go oh, wow I'm so blessed I'm so lucky that that happened and the danger is then the ego is always you know at the ready it's like yep. yeah, you did a great job there <laughs> yeah right I'm gonna offer you yeah and, <laughs> and how and how do we do that even that you know it's like we do need to go yes you did a great job we we all need to be champions of our selves and of each other but it, it's this constant uh i mean there's a humbling it's it's a constant humbling i think humbling is the best word to, yeah. to use here life is a humbling process uh when done so yeah and and I think you know for me that when I know that you know I can say I did really well what I did well was I stayed out of the way you know I was able to just show up and surrender whatever it is I am and have yep for being used in whatever way it needed to be and and I was able to allow that to happen to play out and that's when I go I did that bit really well I'm really for, for having done that and been part of the rest of it deeper I don't want this to finish but it's sort of we we we're eight yeah months. it's amazing how'd that happen that happens every second Monday um, <laughs> so I think um, let's let's take a few minutes because it's like there's so much richness in this conversation today, but let's just take, you know, four or five minutes for everyone to find their own reflective moment. Um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back and close formally here and then bring everyone else up in, into the room. But I'm feeling a little bit greedy. I don't want to share you with anyone else yet, but anyone <laughs> will because I can see everybody's keen to be part of it. Okay, so everyone, let's just take a, a couple of minutes. Um, you know, as you feel most comfortable, many of you I know have your own meditative practices or reflection uh, ways. So however you'd like to do it, but, you know, taking our nice deep breath in that just allows us to be and sit back within ourselves perhaps you know having a sense that all that has passed in this last 50 minutes or so that is speaking directly to your heart and your being today that which is relevant kind of gathers up for you finds its way into your heart without having to diagnose it or analyze it particularly yet anyway but just allowing allowing that which is speaking to you to come sit in your heart and find its place there and that with each breath 
that you take. It sort of nuzzles in further and finds home. And that the strength of what is speaking to you is because there is a dialogue already inside of you. There's a warmth, there's a power and strength. Courage. inherent in your readiness to receive whatever is landing for you today. And I wonder if in these couple of moments of silence, if you could feel that your heart was able to expand to embrace what is emerging, that is so vital in your own journey. Even maybe sitting with your chest up and opening it out to allow the physical feeling of that. And that each breath just allows it to expand even further. As we come to a gentle close of the meditation, I always think it's beautiful to be able to tune in and feel the presence of everyone else's hearts here too. And with gratitude, thank you for sharing that moment and welcome back. So in two minutes time, we will close out the formal aspect of this session. Um, number of people pop off now they kind of allow their hour and then duck off to wherever it is they're heading on the Sunday morning um, I think Melissa has has had to go but before we bring everyone up she's asked a question mm -hmm. that I'm on a similar journey deeper thank you for sharing in particular the thought of just being here resonates deeply can you please share your explorations into different ways of being? This is where I'm stuck. I still need to run a business. I still have a feeling I'm here to do something. Thank you, Melis. I think you touched on some of those things, but perhaps more, more specifically focused. She asked, she'll tune in later and get the, the recording. Yeah, I, I would say that, um... I come back to this process of dying and death. The, the quickest way I know of, of 
becoming present, which is um, another way of talking about being for me, of being in a state of being, is to go, I'm never going to have this moment again. This one, it will be gone. And and just the that question to constantly have that there means that it's it, it sort of always allows for a shift of perception <clears throat> right there and then. Um, it's the best thing I know yeah. to to allow me to really be right here, knowing that I'm never going to have this moment again. Yeah. Um, and I, and I say that um, just and it's partly because it was the way that I really found out of depression because I would I'd go into those dark places and there were there was this one day where I was, I was you know going down the escalator from work the the cloud was so dark above my head there was just felt like there was no way again that there was that I was going to get out of this and I just remember this is like wisdom this beautiful angel who just went, you're never going to have this moment of depression again. And it was such a, it, it, it was like the key to dealing with it. Because then when it came again, it wasn't the sort of refrain of like, oh my God, it's here again. It was, it would be like, I'm never going to have this moment of depression again. And it would be like sort of really sort of saying, Okay, what is it about this moment? What what color is this moment? What's actually happening in this moment? So it would it would bring me fully into the moment, and then it was like I I became curious about my depression every time it would show up because it would be like oh yeah but I haven't had this depression before you, do you know what I mean? So it was it was just like that that journey. So that was that was a journey out of out of darkness in a way, and and that question has been one that that sort of I live with on a daily basis that will always bring me right here to being whatever I'm doing I'm right there then so yeah that would be the one tip that I would leave for Melissa as it were wow that that's reminding me deeper and we can probably start to bring everyone up now Vic in closing formally but I, I just want to share um, I have this young friend in Chile and she I've shared this before here but she she coined this phrase or this idea it's quite similar and it harks back to the two things opposite things can coexist in the same space without contradiction right and it for me it blew me away when she told me I went, that's brilliant when she said I you know if she was feeling depressed or feeling sad or, or feeling angry or jealous or say, jealousy, which is ugly. I, I don't like the feeling mm -hmm. of jealousy at all. <laughs> ever experience it. But when it comes, I go, oh. And she said, I just got, I love my jealousy. And yes. I what are you talking about? And she went, I love my jealousy. Because if you go into that, love is more powerful. Yeah. And it, rather than reject it, it embraces it. And yeah. it becomes nothing nothing ugly anymore it's quite incredible strategy yeah. yeah it's the same thing yeah yeah so wonderful i think that um i i'm really taken by what a extraordinary thing it is to be alive you know you know to have this one period and within within the Sufi tradition one of the one of the um, the quotes that we have is um, I was a hidden treasure wanting to be known and therefore I created the world so that that that's why we exist but then it's it's sort of realizing that if that's the case then what is wanted to be known is our jealousy and what's wanted to be known is our fear and that if we are willing to do that work if we're really talking about doing service then we have to be willing to feel those things fully so that the hidden treasure can be known because the the treasure exists in in every aspect of it and I find that a very freeing again a, a very freeing saying that that anything that's come along and I, I don't mean that in in the way that we often say these things like everything is a gift you know we can say those things um, in a very superficial way but but if they're really given 
if something is given our full attention, that's what we're talking about, then then there's there's something else that occurs. That's there's a spontaneous flow of love, which is what the, um, I started with. So yeah. it feels like a nice way to end. But I really have appreciated being in this community. It's very nice to be introduced to all of you and to see that there's a group of lovely people that get together on a Sunday morning. Well, we have come to the end of our time together. Um, Fiona, you have a glorious birthday day. Everyone else, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for being with us this morning and particularly deeper as you reach the, 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 the sounding of the 12 midnight bell. I think this was <laughs> bell, isn't it? You only get one bell at midnight. Yeah. <laughs> you get all 12 and a lot more. Um, thank you so, so much for being as raw and rich and beautiful as you are with us oh, it was a real pleasure thank you for the invite yeah. and i think um victor you're so right i can see that all of us are smiling and there, there is something about the power of the smile so i will leave smiling and take that to my bed which is a very nice way to go to bed and i hope you all have a wonderful rest of day and week Thank you. And I look forward to coming again at some point. So we will. Bye, everyone. Love everyone. Thank you. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of The Optimist Heart as much as I did. We'd love you to get involved. Um, Caroline welcomes um, your input, sort of speak as you'd like, and for you to join in as people joined in today. So please get involved through the Centre for Optimism. Our website uh, is on the screen, centreforoptimism.com, and you can sign up for alerts and you can sign up for membership, uh, and most of all, you can share in a very optimistic community. We wish you a wonderful, optimistic day.